Not sure what I'm supposed to do at this point. Feel free to keep discussing. Do you have to press enter? Yeah. There's only so much you can do with this. <laughs> yeah. It's got her, the Black Widow. So uh, my name is Nick Hill. Uh, Martin's my supervisor. And as pretty much everyone who's gone today, I work with the enormous uh, and great scintillometry group at Toronto. So first, why the Black Widow? Uh, personally, I'm more interested in the pulsar than the scintillation properties, which is probably not a popular opinion here. But uh, it has some really interesting emission phenomena, like giant pulses and mode changing that we've seen in a millisecond pulsar. And I always wanted to study those a bit more. Uh, and the scintillation and interstellar scattering makes that hard, so I want to get rid of the interstellar scattering so I can look at the, mo the pulsar emission in more detail and probably learn something about the mechanisms. Uh, second, the eclipse lensing is extremely interesting. As you hopefully remember the last three talks, uh, like Rob specifically, where he mentioned the uh, that we can resolve the pulsar magnetosphere with the lensing. So being able to uh, look at the eclipse lensing in absence of interstellar scattering would be a bit more helpful than uh, right now, where we have to sort of just deal with the fact that the pulsar scintillates. And finally, uh, as we discussed in the discussion session right now, uh, the Black Widow is likely to be a very high mass neutron star. And being able to measure its orbital parameters, specifically the inclination, uh, in an, another independent method would really help solidify what, what the confidence on its uh, high mass or low mass, wh whichever it is. All right. So you all already know that, but just to set up some terminology, we get an intrinsic pulsar signal, which I call X of T for the rest of the talk, and an impulse response function, which I call H, which is pretty much what uh, some people call the Green's function. I like impulse response function, so that's what I'm going to call it. And Z of T is what we see, uh, and obviously plus some noise, which uh, in ideal situations we assume doesn't exist. All right. One cool thing, and this is a part of uh, a, a paper that was published this year by Rob, uh, we can use giant pulses to descatter one another and just get a direct measurement of, a, of an impulse response function. Because the best way to measure an impulse response function is obviously to have an impulse. And giant pulse definitely fits that criteria. So you just have a giant pulse. And if you assume that it's basically su supposed to be as close to a delta function as it can get, then you get some measurement of the impulse response function. And because uh, giant pulses can be chromatic, and we know in this pulsar they are chromatic, uh, we mainly just use the phases for the impulse response function here. So what we basically do is we have a really high signal to noise giant pulse. We get some uh, measurement of what we think the impulse response function's phases looks li look like. Then we go to another giant pulse close to it, so within the, uh, within the scintillation time scale. And we try to descatter it with the first one. And at the third plot at the bottom, you basically, we basically descatter it really well. We get a nice delta function. And this is basically the topic of the whole, to uh, whole paper. And this is a figure I pulled from the paper, where we have the original high signal to noise giant pulse, and it's descattering different giant pulses around it, except this one in the middle, because uh, not all giant pulses are true impulses. This one seemed to have some sort of triple peak structure, so obviously it didn't work. But 
if your giant pulse is an, is a true impulse, then it sh it should be possible to descatter one with the other and backwards by just m using a bright one as a measure for the impulse response and then just descattering the rest of it. The problem is this is very noisy. But yeah, before we get to that, this is also a cool plot from uh, Rob's paper where we have the dynamic spectrum that was measured from the pulsar data, the autocorrelation of it, and the cross-correlation between the giant pulses and the dynamic spectrum, and then the correlations we get from descattering the giant pulses, and they basically track really well. So this is a cool little plot that shows that the giant pulse descattering is very much related to the interstellar scattering. And, uh, we can use it, uh, like it, the, the decoherence timescales for those are the same as the dynamic spectrum. Although the, the cor correlation coefficient much less because giant pulses have random structures in them. Okay, but giant pulses give noisy measurements of phases because, well, there's noise. And giant pulses are intrinsically chromatic so we can d determine the amplitudes. So can we do something better? And most of my, uh, uh, hopefully work for the next few months will be based around this. It's a technique that was, uh, that was uh, presented in, uh, Walker, by Walker and Demarest called cyclic spectroscopy, and I'll go over the sort of introductory theory for that pretty quickly. So basic signals analysis, you have a stationary signal where the statistics don't change, are time invariant. Then there's another class of signal called the cyclostationary signal where the statistics of time are cyclic uh, have a periodic nature in time. So if you take the same phase in the cycle, you get a stationary signal, but at different phases in the cycle, you have different uh, stationary signals. And a pulsar signal can basically be seen as an amplitude modulated noise, uh, because that's practically what we measure when we look at the electric field that comes from a pulsar. And let's call this X again with the intrinsic uh, uh, emission. We have some simple filter just for an illustration, and then you uh, measure this when it comes to your telescope, and that's basically uh, uh, the filtered uh, signal you have. If your filtered uh, filter is linear and time invariant, then your resultant signal is also cyclostationary, which is great because you can make the assumption for the observed signal, not just the original signal. All right. So in traditional pulsar spectroscopy, usually what people do is you have the original signal. The left-hand side is what we observe. The right-hand side is what we think is actually happening. But the observables on that side of the equal sign. So you take the Fourier transform, and then you don't know what to do with the Fourier transform. So you basically take the power spectrum, uh, which is defined there. You just have an expected value where you just take the amplitude, the squared modulus of uh, the uh, observed uh, Fourier transform. This does not preserve the phases of the impulse response function. So one of the things that a lot of people are trying to do in this room, I think, is trying to figure out the phase of the impulse response function. It's all about the impulse response function. If we can find out a good way to measure it with uh, decent accuracy, we would be able to do a lot of things that people are trying to do. So yeah, we can do better if we make certain assumptions. So if we make the assumption that the pulsar signal that's observed is truly cyclostationary, then we can do this. Now we all know that it isn't actually cyclostationary. There's a spin down rate, so you're cycle length keeps changing. Uh, some pulsars have unstable pulse, pro uh, pulse profiles and there's timing noise, whatever. But you know, uh, if, you if you don't make the assumption, you can't do this. So let's make the assumption and just make it happen anyway. And for a spin down, it's fine because you can sort of stretch time to make it seem cyclostationary, so it's fine. And the impulse response function is linear and time invariant, which is not true over long periods of time because we know that the dynamic spectrum shows change. That's the whole point of the dynamic spectrum. But over a short period of time uh, within the scintillation time scale, this is true. So if you have time integrations that are short enough that your uh, impulse response function isn't changing during it, then you'll be able to do this. So these are the two main papers. And they're, very, they're really interesting, pretty dense, and they describe the whole technique. And also, it's also the only time I've ever seen this technique being used successfully, because uh, I've been. Sorry? There are, there are more papers. But they haven't been successful in doing this. Oh, yeah? Making cyclic spectra is trivial. Oh, right, right, right. I meant the cyclic spectral analysis. Like, I've made cyclic spectra. You'll see pictures later. But uh, like the actual, like the money shot at the end where they have this beautiful secondary spectra without the uh, self-convolution. I'll get to it. 
So in cyclic spectroscopy, you assume uh, the cyclical nature of the pulsar, and you have this equation, which does preserve the phase of the uh, inner pulse response function. And alpha there is just an integer multiple of the pulse rotation frequency, which is the harmonic. And one cool byproduct of this uh, technique is that you don't have to give up time resolution for frequency resolution. So if you, like me, are interested in emissions, and you don't just integrate all the power in your pulse profile to find the dynamic spectrum, you actually care about preserving the time structure of the pulse profile, this is what the traditional spectroscopy gives you. This is what cyclic spectroscopy gives you. You can have practically arbitrary spectral resolution given you know, infinite computing resources. And there's a better, for this one I made like an, a year ago, so it's terrible. I made this last night. It's much cleaner, much less noisier. And you can, uh, this is called the periodic spectrum, by the way. No, it's not a power spectrum, so it can go to the negatives. And if you look closely here, you can see it gets darker than the noise. So you can see sort of the interference pattern at points. So this is pretty useful just to begin with. So this is uh, 2 megahertz, so the uh, vertical axis frequency, this is the pulse phase, and it's about 2 megahertz, uh, that's the cut I've made. This? This is for about 50 seconds? 50. 50? Yeah. So actually the scintillation pattern is pretty stable up to 90-ish seconds, which is what like, Rob was able to descatter giant pulses f uh, up to 90 and more. And I used 50 because basically I'd made cyclic spectra for eight seconds at a time, and I just sort of looked through, did an animated sort of run through of them until I saw them significantly change around the time that I was looking for. So this is made up of a sum of all the periodic spectra that, in, that don't really change much at all. And I mean, you can make smaller run. This is made from eight seconds, so it's not terrible. You, you can go to smaller integration. I just wanted, you know, a pretty plot, so. But also, this, is, uh, this one's pretty useful because when I did run this through the analysis, which I'll get through, it does work generally. But yeah, there's, there's clearly work to be done here. So when it works, and this was done on 1937, you do the analysis and you descatter your uh, pulse profile. And in 1937, they discovered this little uh, extra part of the pulse profile that <laughs> was scattered away initially. And that one has been seen at higher frequencies by other papers, so that's how they confirmed that they weren't seeing just a wrong uh, descattering, that they had actually scattered it correctly. This is what their impulse response function looks like. So if you just look at just the traditional way of doing it, you would have gone this dynamic spectrum. It's from their paper. And if you use the cyclic spectral analysis and use the impulse response function they get, then you get that. And the cool thing is, uh, and I can talk about this later if anyone's interested. I have like appendices at the end that talk about how noise is dealt with in this uh, analysis. But noise is basically effectively excised just naturally out of the analysis. So the RFI just doesn't show up. Whoops, there. So the RFI goes away. You get a much cleaner uh, dynamic spectrum. And then they use this dynamic spectrum to first create what is conventionally the secondary spectrum, which looks like that. And you can tell that there, there's hints of inverted arclets. It's easier to see on an LCD monitor. Or yeah, just on the projector, it's harder to see. But the cool thing is this is not what you want to do with this. You have the original impulse response functions. You just want to use it directly with the phases given to you. You don't want to do use the amplitudes. And they get this. And this is reminiscent of basically what Dana showed yesterday uh, when she tried to when she deconvolved the secondary spectrum to get rid of the inverted arclets. This does it naturally. Uh, you can also see that the naturally the z the negative part of the delays are zero because you know causality is uh, dealt with properly here. Also, as per yesterday's discussion. And so, if this worked and we could get this to work on other pulsars, it would be a really great way to. So sort of look at the, uh, the delay and Doppler uh, shift field. For, and we can maybe make measurements, you know, pretty much whatever you want to do with it at this point without having to deal with the inverted arclets. So I tried this with the Black Widow, and I got some, uh, some result. It qualitatively looks good, but it's actually wrong. And, uh, but, and this is the pulse, uh, so the pulse profile that I get out of it when I descatter. You can see it actually takes this uh, Gaussian profile with the exponential tail and just makes it a Gaussian profile. So it looks right at first glance. But it's not right because, thankfully, on Black Widow, we have giant pulses. So we can test this with the giant pulses. And the impulse response function I got did not successfully or completely descatter the giant pulses. It slightly descattered, but not completely. So there's clearly work to be done on this. 
But the great thing about the Black Widow is that unlike 1937, we don't have, uh, there, there, uh, we already see a lot of pulse components in the original pulse profile. So we can't just descatter and find a new pulse component and determine that we've done it right. But on the other hand, we have giant pulses all over our baseband data, which we can use to verify that we're doing the analysis right. So at least we're not in this blind. We can figure, we know when we've done it right, we know when we haven't. So the Black Widow is honestly not ideal for this technique because one, signal is not truly cyclostationary. The mode changing affects the, the assumption that your pulse profile is constant throughout your time integration. Because for different time integrations, you get different intrinsic profiles. And so you can make that assumption, which is the basic assumption they made in the original paper. The giant pulses show up every now and then that completely ruin your cyclostationarity. So we just kind of assume that doesn't happen, but maybe the dealing with that will help clean this up. The other thing is the pulse profile is wide and has many components. 19, 1937 was really ideal for this technique because the profile is impulsive. It's very, it's, the pulse components are thin, they're not, and there are just two of them, an interpulse and a main pulse. So because you have just an impulsive pulse profile, it's much easier to use a gradient descent and just discover your impulse response function as a result. But when you have a wide pulse profile, that's much harder because you have yeah, the number of minima you can get stuck into increases by a lot. But we can verify results with giant pulses. Now interesting to know, 1937 also has uh, giant pulses. It's the, I think it's the first millisecond pulsar to have uh, been discovered with giant pulses. But the two papers didn't ever mention seeing giant pulses, dealing with giant pulses, or verifying with giant pulses. So I'm not sure what the uh, status of that is. So what's next? Being highly optimistic, because if I wasn't, then I wouldn't know what to do uh, for the next few months. Uh, we can use giant pulses and other techniques to estimate an impulse response function to, as a starting guess so that we don't get stuck in arbitrary minima. So one of the problems with the analysis is that it has this sort of ironic behavior where to solve a cyclic spectrum, you have to have already solved another one near it because you use the results of the first one for the second one. So the doing the first one is always the hardest one because essentially what you need is a good guess for your impulse response function and your intrinsic profile. So we can use any other techniques to determine what the intrinsic profile looks like better than what we already can or if we can guess an initial impulse response function using giant pulses or other techniques, then we might be able to solve this with more efficiency. And assuming we can do this, we might be able to descatter baseband directly to achieve all the science goals I mentioned earlier. And hopefully, if everything goes well and, I'm, and the optimism works out, I can present the results of this at the next interlometry meeting in a year, maybe, at Moscow, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Observed towards young pulsars, and there's no universal agreement on what an extreme scattering event actually is, so feel free to disagree with my definitions. Um, so first off, I realized the last time I gave this talk, and those of you who are in Manchester will recognize most of the slides here, I had not included a background onto what an extreme scattering event was. I figured someone else would have done it this week, but I put this in just in case. Luckily, I did. So this is the original extreme scattering event observed by Fidel et al. Uh, and reported in 1987. So it's also the anniversary of the discovery of extreme scattering events. Um, and what they saw was in a monitoring program towards a set of active galactic nuclei. They were just taking uh, light curves as a function of time. They saw this curious thing uh, towards this memorably named source. And what it looks like is a quick rise in flux, a dip, and then an exit. And we've seen things like this uh, several times this week where a lens will scatter flux out to larger angles and therefore you're left with a deficit in between. And uh, at higher frequencies, it had a much spikier uh, signature. And this is kind of, again, consistent with something like a plasma lens where it's, it's smoother at low frequencies and then you see kind of uh, more resolution of the phase at high frequencies. Uh, this sparked a flurry of work trying to understand what these things were. 
And we've seen several times a paper by Romani et al. in 1987 kind of talking about high electron density regions and supernova remnants, uh, filaments in the ISM, capable of providing these types of lenses. Uh, they all end up requiring uh, what Barney said were these embarrassingly large electron densities of hundreds to even thousands per cubic centimeter. Um, and it was kind of left there uh, because these are relatively rare events and they're difficult to find in real time. They last a while. You see this one is kind of a six month, uh, well, a few month type time scale. Um, and are mostly discovered in archival data. So it's only relatively recently that people have actually started to look for these things in real time, in particular an effort led by uh, Keith Bannister uh, to use the compact array in Australia to look for them has been very successful. Um, so we thought of another way to go after these things, which is monitoring young pulsars. And there's a program that's been going on at Parks for about 10 years now um, that was originally started to monitor pulsars in support of Fermi. Fermi is a gamma ray space telescope. It has a relatively small area. You might get a photon from a pulsar once a week. It's very difficult to detect a pulse profile that way unless you already know what the pulsar spin ephemeris is and you can co-add all of your, your photon arrival times up over 10 years. And that actually works really well. And Parks data have led to the discovery of about 40 pulsars with Fermi and other radio telescopes have also contributed. Uh, but this is a rich data set uh, with 10 years, and so now you can start to look at all sorts of interesting slow processes, in particular refraction in the ISM, or if you're looking for other slow processes, extreme scattering events. And we were just kind of doing this effort uh, to go through and characterize the refraction when a couple of things popped out at us, and it's a lot easier to talk about two things than 150 things, so that's what I'm going to do. So the two events that we found are radically different in their properties. And so this first one, people might object to me calling an ESE. Um, I won't be the first to do it. But. So this is towards uh, one of the brightest gamma ray pulsars in the sky, as it turns out, uh, B1055 minus 52. And despite the fact that it's relatively deep into the galactic plane, it's not thought to be a distant pulsar, but we really don't know where it is. Uh, older electron models put it at about one and a half parsecs. The most recent electron model puts it at 100 parsecs. So there's a little discrepancy. The fact that it's a very bright gamma ray pulsar also suggests that it's pretty close to us. So I've kind of pegged it at around three or 400 parsecs. And this is kind of a, a typical uh, overview of the data that we have over these, uh, I think, nine years shown here. So this is the, probably the important plot uh, to look at for this pulsar. And this is its uh, spectrum as a function of time. So the color scale indicates the the flux density, and I've truncated it at five. This actually goes up to about 100 if I, hadn't, if I hadn't truncated it. But this is the observed flux divided by the mean flux. And then it's over our observing band, which is about 256 megahertz at 20 centimeters. So you can see it's kind of doing some, some normal scintillation here uh, with a characteristic diffractive scale of about 50 megahertz. Then we get this whomping big uh, a refractive event here, and you can see the flux goes up to nearly 100 millijanskis, the normal flux is about seven. Um, and around that time, the diffractive properties change radically. So you can see instead of this slow variation across the observing band, we now have hundreds of, well, maybe tens of centils in the observing band. Uh, and this is shown here with the diffractive bandwidth, which is up around 50 megahertz. And then around here, takes a quick drop and continues to uh, decrease for several years. And then at the end of this, what I'm calling an ESE, it goes back up to its previous value. Again, there's another refractive event. Is it at all related to this ESE? Possibly, or it's, maybe it's just coincidence, who knows? And then ever since then, when we've observed it, it's kind of, again, in this, I don't want to say quiescent state, but normal state. Uh, and I've plotted here the modulation index, and you can see that when it's uh, going through the ESE, it actually comes up above one, indicating that there's strong refraction contributing to the variation. Yeah, in the ESE, because there are so many centils in the band, you basically average the flux down. But do you, whether, do you have higher effect resolution to see if it will come back up again if we dissolve all the centils? Um, they're basically resolved. So I think in this case, the reason why the modulation index is dropped is because you're converging to the true flux because you're averaging over that exponential distribution. But yes, if we looked at the distribution of the centils, they would show that it was exponential. Does that make sense? That's right, it's smooth and it's smoothed over this, you can see the kernel. Yeah. 
this is the modulation index, and here is its, its key. So up here, the modulation index is about one point. Is this the brown line you're talking about? Uh, the dots are the individual flux density measurements. And then I've basically just taken the variance of them in a sliding window to produce this modulation index. So we were lucky enough to have some longer observations during the, uh, right when the CSE started. Um, these little red lines indicate the longer observations I'm going to show to you. And these just happened to be here, but when we went back and looked at them, once we discovered this, the CSE, we saw the fringing that's characteristic of scattering from a thin screen. And indeed, in the um, secondary spectra, we see, we see some parabolic arcs. Um, Park, sadly, is not Arecibo. You can imagine that if you saw a pattern like this with Arecibo, that you would be able to get you know, structure out to much longer delays or larger Doppler shifts. But our dynamic range here is at best a factor of 10 to the 5, and we've seen up to 10 to the 9 from Arecibo. So there's no replacement for displacement. But we, do, we are able to characterize the, um, the curvature of this arc, which gives us some constraints. Because we know the proper motion of this pulsar from pulsar timing, and we have a guess at the distance, this does give us some, some constraints on the lens distance. Uh, and once we found this event, we started to get some, some nice observations uh, relatively recently. There was some commissioning work going on in the telescope, and ended up that there were some long, you know, 10 hour slots available. So we just stared at this pulsar for a while and got some updated uh, dynamic spectra with an even larger bandwidth receiver. And the interesting thing we found was that there were actually evidence for two arcs in this more recent data. An inner arc here uh, with a, a tighter curvature and then the original ESE uh, arc and some structure in between. Uh, and if you, you kind of plug in the numbers, what you find is that the, the arc during the ESE is probably at about 200 parsecs and then this, this kind of more recent screen is around 100 parsecs. From us. From us, yes. Uh, and here, just a couple more observations. Again, you really could wish for a, a higher sensitivity uh, receiver, and a bigger telescope. Uh, there are some interesting things. So these observations are taken on three subsequent days, as are these. Um, so we have really good cadence with these observations. And you can actually see that the structure within uh, the parabola changes over this. And the refractive time scale is about a day. So this is consistent even with just plain old Kolmogorov turbulence, where you can see lens asymmetries change on that type of time scale. Uh, so what does this all mean? Well, this pulsar, if you put it at the distance we think it is, 300 or 400 parsecs, uh, this 1 to 200 parsecs for the arcs would be consistent with being right at the edge of the loop 1 bubble in the Wollobin uh, picture. And uh, just kind of coincidentally, based on pulsar DM measurements, this latest DM model puts the loop 1 bubble at about 200 parsecs. So you can imagine that's a pretty good place for a screen to be. Um, and if you look at a, an H-alpha image, there is some larger scale filamentary structure that's somewhat aligned with the pulsar proper motion. This is just completely subjective. There are also a couple of hot stars along the line of sight that could potentially be contributing to some scattering. Okay, so that's one ESE. The other one is a much more canonical ESE uh, towards this pulsar that's definitely in the galactic plane. At a relatively large distance, all we know for sure is that it's closer than 6 kiloparsecs just based on H1 absorption. It's much larger DM, 30 for 1057. We think it's at about 3 kiloparsecs, um, but it might be as close as 400. Uh, so what do we see? Again, here's this flux density measurement. And here, the red and the blue dots indicate the top and the bottom of the observing band. So this is an achromatic. Uh, everything in this light curve is achromatic because all of those agree. And we see a nice rise, dip, a rise, a dip, and then this is more or less six months ago. So who knows what it's doing now? I'll come back and visit that at some point. Uh, and this is the same picture. You can see that there's much less uh, diffractive scintillation going on, although potentially some enhancements here as this, uh, this lensing of it kind of peaks. The interesting thing about this one is that, as I already said, it's kind of achromatic, and if it's a simple lens, you would actually be able to see the difference between the top and the bottom of our observing band here. So it's more complicated than just streaming some plasma across the line of sight. And it's also extremely long. Uh, at 1,500 days, this thing is the longest, and it's probably continuing and doing something else. So maybe it's up to 2,000 days long. Um, and it's relatively large distance. That makes the lens, that makes the lens fairly large. I've done just a you know, completely naive Clegg et al. model, which requires stupidly large electron densities. And done the ray tracing, it agrees with the data relatively well. 
And if you, if you do this type of model, you end up with a transverse size of about 20 AU. Uh, there aren't actually any hot stars that are smoking guns along this line of sight, but it's much less well characterized than the other one, especially because this pulsar is more distant. Um, so there are lots of things you can conclude from this. I think what I really, really motivate is we're getting into a golden age of pulsar timing when Chime comes online, when Meerkat comes online, Malonglo is doing its thousand pulsar array now. Uh, we can look for these things and find them towards pretty much any single pulsar. So if we want to find weird events in the ISM, we can you know, really kind of do something orthogonal to what we're doing with Arecibo with looking at these nearby pulsars. We can probe lines of sight towards more distant pulsars all over the sky. Uh, and this is just kind of a, a proof of the concept. And then I think the other interesting thing is that these are in fact probably very large lenses. Both of them come out at about 20 AU with the typical velocities. Lenses slash clouds slash whatever scattering things they are. So I'll stop there. Thank you. So it's 150 sight lines where it's a work in progress to characterize the actual rate because some of them are faint and so you wouldn't necessarily resolve these. Some of these are diffractively dominated. So I'd say they're probably about 100 good lines of sight and eight-ish years of data and two events. Uh, I've forgotten now, but it's of order well, a few months, maybe. And the you, reason I'm raising that mm -hmm. is, of course, refractive scintillation itself is uh, uh, modulation mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, at least up to a factor of two in, in terms of time. And um, now, of course, refractive scintillation and lensing are not two completely different things. It's kind of a Sure. I think I'm not 100 yeah. percent sure that we aren't seeing some effects from the Earth's modulation here, because this looks suspiciously close to one year. But I'd say that this is kind of the characteristic refractive okay. burbling along here. So it's I would say that this is large relative to the observed refraction. Uh, no, I've talked with Adam, uh, and 1057 has actually been the subject of a VLBI campaign to try and get a parallax distance to it. Uh, one thing I would add is that both of these would be great to have well-known distances to. They're bright, and you could easily get a VLBI parallax. But because it's southern hemisphere, the VLBI situation is just so much worse than it is in the northern hemisphere. The 1057 campaign was unsuccessful, and no observations have been attempted towards this particular pulsar. So. Uh, minus 50, yeah, minus 53 for, um, for 57, 52. So it's, it's well out of sight of northern hemisphere telescopes, but possibly with Meerkat, it'd be worth tackling. Right. This is the lens profile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, I mean, again, it's absurd, these uh, densities, but you could actually hide a pretty large lens in the observed DM variations. So it's a similar magnitude, but it doesn't agree with each other. That's right. 
as you can see, I'm doing, as you could see for a moment, I'm doing simultaneously some observing. So if you hear some Australian bird noises, don't worry. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk about the 1509, and it seems like about 98% of the audience already knows everything about it. So I actually included quite a lot of extra stuff that I will just run through, and just so that you know what other things you can talk to me about. So one thing, I'll, I'll just promote the Astronomer's Telegram. We just discovered an FRB with a DM of 1100, and it's uh, highly scattered. Uh, so the sort of uh, width, depending how it, where you define it, it's either 27 millisecond or 47 millisecond, whether you look at half or bottom. Uh, and since this is a Black Widow session, I'm also going to very briefly show some results from 2051 minus OE27, which is the second Black Widow ever discovered. And this is what we call the wonder eclipse, where basically there's a scintillation maximum almost uh, exactly co uh, coincident with the eclipse. So as Martin mentioned, at 20 centimeter, those eclipses are not really eclipses. You can see the pulsar every 10 seconds quite clearly. Uh, this is the profile. And actually there is a component not reported in any other publication, uh, but well, we can't really see it in normal observation, so, and it's very close to half a turn, so possibly it's just an intervals. Uh, this is a dynamic spectrum. If you were at the Pulsar group meeting last week, you may remember that I showed you a completely different plot. So the difference between last week and this week is now that I just normalized uh, the dynamic spectrum in every sub-integration independently to change the contrast. Um, these are the DM changes. Also, I added those after I think Martin again made a comment about the DM oscillating during the eclipse. So this is also quite clear here. You can also note that the uncertainties are very large and that's because we're fitting simultaneously for scattering. And scattering and DM changes are very highly covariant. So the uncertainties on both get quite large, but we do have very strong evidence for our anisotropic scattering in the, during this e eclipse. We also measured the RM. Uh, so surprisingly, the RM value was actually not published ever for the pulsar before, so that's about minus 50 few. And we also see very clear depolarization in both linear and circular polarization during, during the eclipse. And also in the, so that observation spanned two orbits. This is the second eclipse, but the signal to noise here is much lower. All right, so this is just a teaser. If you want to talk to me about Black Widows, uh, you know where to find me. All right, uh, so now very briefly to LOFAR. So we've seen this plot. So all the data that I'll be talking about is uh, recorded in Germany. Oh, Germany. Uh, but also the same pulsar backends were installed in Poland, Sweden, and a very similar one in France. So uh, there's a lot of uh, potential for pulsar observing in, in LOFR in the sort of so-called owner's time, which is basically two days a week. And in practice, we observe three days a week. So we have this, uh, you, if you're interested, if your favorite pulsar is being observed, you can go to this link. Uh, or you can just Google me and there's a link on my page. And basically there's a list of pulsars that we observe, including the time span, number of observations and epochs, uh, the sort of time, total time span, and a whole bunch of other metadata. One of the cool things from Julian Donner's, uh, I think it was his Bachelor thesis, is that the LOFAR, despite, you know, e even in the signal station observations, which are not terribly sensitive, we still get very high precision of the dispersion measure measurements just because uh, you know, everything gets heavily amplified at low frequencies. So what you're looking at is the histogram of median DM uncertainty from our measurements and the sort of darker histogram, that's the millisecond pulsars. And the vertical lines show the median values that we either uh, extracted or guessed from other publications because they don't always provide them, so we had to sort of try to estimate them. And you can see that basically the, the, this line is the the median value of the MSPs for LOFAR, and this is the median value for the slow pulsars. So you can see that even single station LOFAR, despite being such a small telescope, is uh, doing better than any other publication, any other published efforts. And you can find that online in Julian Donner's thesis if you search for radio astronomy Bielefeld. All right, so on to 1509. This is a pulse profile. So you, uh, this is an actual data. Uh, even though it may look like uh, like simulation because there is hardly any noise. If your eyesight is incredibly good, and well, I don't think actually the resolution on that is quite good enough, but there's a tiny amount of noise. Uh, 
And interestingly, there is a little bit larger amount of noise over here. So if you look at the same plot, but in logarithmic scale, you see that there is this signal coming in uh, after the component. I'm not sure about this guy. I think this is just a sort of very low level emission from the profile. And we will get back to this uh, post cursor in a moment. This is just the dispersion measure variations for this pulsar. So they look incredibly noisy. And some time ago, probably two years ago, I went to a curtain for completely different purposes, basically comparing polarization between LOFAR and MWA. And I was sort of showing what we were doing with LOFAR. JP was sitting in the corner and, and snoring. And then Ramesh Bhatt looked at this little bit of DM here and asked me like, oh, is that an extreme scattering event? At which time JP stood up and screamed, what, did someone say extreme scattering event? And since then, we've, we have been collaborating on, on this pulsar. <laughs> so you can see the DM is really all over the place. And in the beginning, we were quite worried whether we're doing something stupid with measuring the DMs. Uh, if, you, if you zoom in on one of those densely sampled regions, you can see that the DMs are actually, you know, if you look at, uh, so this is, I think, two days, or maybe three days, or almost four uh, days of data. The DM can be quite stable. If you compare the dispersion measure from different stations, so different color is different lower stations, they're quite consistent. But also occasionally, the pulsar does this crazy DM changes where across two days, you get a change of uh, 10 to minus three in just two days. Oh, and maybe I should also just point out that this pulsar is moving a thousand kilometers a second. So what two days here, you know, can correspond to about a hundred days for a normal pulsar. So this is a little bit of an unfair statement. Uh, we're also observing this pulsar every week with one of the German stations for three days uh, a week. So we have very highly sampled uh, dispersion measure changes. We also try to, because the low forest fractional bandwidth is quite large, we also try to basically measure the DM by splitting the, the low forest band into two halves so, and pretend they're independent measurements. And we're basically trying to detect the chromatic DM. So this is from Jim's paper, where he just basically tries to do some simulations of the scattering disk size. And you're basically probing a different volume of the ISM at different frequencies. So you do expect to see a difference. Uh, and this is what you get when you do the chromatic DMs. So this looks really messy. Uh, but if you zoom in, uh, some bits of it actually look fairly convincing in the sense that there is a series of points uh, which behave in a fairly smooth manner. And at the end of the talk, I'll, so, I'll show a similar plot, but for a different pulsar. All right, but since we are at scintillometry and I'm already uh, out of half of my time, I should probably move on to something related to what you guys want to listen about. So let's go back to this component here. So the, and also note that there's actually another component visible here. So this is an average of about a year's worth of data um, and stuck together. So let's see what happens when we plot the same data. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut off everything here. So on the edge, you will actually see a little bit of the main pulse. So there will be, there'll be a whole bunch, bunch of bright pulses. And I'm just going to plot that as a function of time. So this is what we get. And you may have seen that plot many times. But previously, the time axis was heavily distorted. I just tried to uh, fix the distortion. So this is not quite linear time, but almost linear time. Uh, so you see basically, as I said, the, this, this is the sort of left, you know, just the edge of the main poles. This is one of the, what we call the ghosts or the echoes. So you can see it approaching the main poles and getting brighter and brighter. So the main pulse is normalized to a unity area. And there's also a second component which is merging in with the first one. So the data that Olaf was showing in his uh, talk was taken when, when, where those two components are very close to each other. I think it was rough, roughly here or maybe here. And basically, uh, that's why he was only talking about two echoes, because he only started doing VLBI when the two images have merged. And there's the third weak comp component. I'm not sure how well this comes out on the projector, but it, in general, you should be able to see it. So the, for a while, we weren't sure whether this is intrinsic. You know, We do no pulsars where a new component shows up, stays visible for a while, and then disappears, although normally they don't really move around as much. Uh, so we, we were tr trying to figure out how do we, f uh, how can we tell whether this is intrinsic to the pulsar or some sort of propagation effect. 
And one of the ways to do it is to just measure the location of those echoes and see how they be behave as a function of time. So this is, uh, this is showing the results of that. So this is a, uh, the first ghost and the third ghost. I'm not including the second one because I'm still uh, trying to finish a code, which is basically why I haven't published this. Uh, that measures properly the second ghost, which basically merges in with the first one. Um, and also, if you cross-validate uh, polynomial fit to this data, you can, with very high confidence, tell that this is a quadratic approach rather than some different order of a polynomial. And that's a fairly good indication that it's an ISM. And of course, uh, by now we know from the uh, VLBI observing that it, it indeed is a uh, ISM effect rather than intrinsic effect because we do see that uh, flux coming from different direction on the sky. And a plot for Dana, uh, since she talks about those models where uh, she predicts delays and magnification, so this is the delay versus magnification. This is quite noisy in the same code that will give me the uh, reliable position of the second echo will also give me a more reliable version of this plot. And I, was, I spent a bit of last week tr working with Dana trying to get a model that can actually explain this and it doesn't work at all, but we have ways of improving it. So another thing, uh, which is interesting if we go back here for a moment, is that what you can do is you can take one of those fits and what I did is I just chose the primary ghost as that's where most of the flux is. And then you can artificially shift your data such that all, the, all, all of the ghosts uh, line up. So basically artificially force them to be at the same phase. And then if you add up that data, this is what you get. And I just realized I deleted the slide that was showing the other plot, but basically, so this is just the leftover from whitening the, the main component of the profile. And this is the stacked primary ghost. So you can see that it actually looks quite similar to the, to the main pulse. But if, you, if your memory is very good, you might remember that the ratio of the peak to the wings was different by about a factor of two. So this is one thing that we still kind of understand where this comes from. How do you, how do you make the reflection of the, of the profile look different? Like, it's, it's fairly easy maybe to imagine, you know, you're scattering it or something, but I don't understand how can you change the flux ratio. So initially we thought, all right, maybe you're basically looking at the beam of the pulsar at a different angle. But uh, from Olaf, we already know that the screen is very close to Earth, so then the angle at the pulsar is actually very small. Uh, oh, and by the way, this uh, about a 100 millisecond delay that you see between the main pulse and the ghost, that uh, corresponds to about half, a, half an arc second, which was mentioned earlier, but just for completeness, I'll put it out here. Uh, so that's one thing we don't understand, and if it was just slicing the beam to a different angle, we could try to figure that out from polarization. But that doesn't seem to work because unfortunately the polarization degree is quite low, even in the, in the main pulse. And then if you stack that and you know, if, the, if the refraction or reflection or scattering or whatever it is affects the polarization, or let's say there's just a variable RM, then stacking you know, more than a year worth of data is just gonna smear it out. All right, and I'm almost out of time, so let me just go back to this chromatic DM plot. Um, so as I said, this doesn't look very convincing, but there's also another pulsar, 2219 plus 4754, which also shows the same sort of uh, behavior when it comes to an echo, and I will show that later. But this is just the dispersion measure variations. So those are much better behaved than the 1509, sort of much smoother behavior, and also it's much easier to measure the chromaticity. So again, this is the same plot with the red points showing the dispersion measure estimated from the lower half of the band and blue from the higher half of the band. So you can see it's, it's, it's very clear here. And Daniele Michili just submitted a paper where he talks about the echo in that pulsar. So it's somewhat similar. Uh, the main difference is the separations are much, much smaller. So here we're talking of tens of maybe 20 milliseconds as opposed to 100 milliseconds. That's 2219 22, plus 4754. All right, thank you.
So you can see that on that plot because the the main pulse is normalized to some value, I think just unity. So the the bright or the what's the opposite of brightness? Darkness. The br well, the brightness of the of of the ghost is basically tells you the flux, and also this plot sort of shows it, except there is no time on either of the axes. But basically, as the delay, like this is sort of a you know proxy of time. So as the delay decreases, we're moving ahead in time, and the magnificent or the flux ratio increases. So the the ratio, the flux contained in the ghost compared to the main pulse increases with time. So that can be quantified. Yeah. So that's what we were working on with Dana. Yeah, that's what, what I that's exactly what I meant when I said that what Dana and I tried last week didn't work because yeah, the flux increases much more rapidly than you would expect from a simple model. Mm. So you mean when the first and the second echo merge? Yeah. yeah. So the so I mean so the first, like so this the last data on those plots is from about seven months ago. So I expect by now this the second and first as in like this, the centroids of those two probably would have overlapped by now, or are very close to it. So it would be interesting to look at the uh, sort of yeah most recent data and it's processing as we speak. In here, yeah. Well, is that you're measuring the scattering time and the DM from a consumer cell by saying? Oh, the the 2051. No, no, no I want, want yeah, this yeah. one. I just wondered if there any, I could imagine at least that this one line of sight where you see the really from quite a different line of sight that, that yep. misses some scattering region that would be on, that mm. would be on top of this one, right? That the scattering time wouldn't necessarily have to be the same between the two. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's I'm right. Not sure, I'm just not no, no, that, that that that's true, but I mean, I but that doesn't help with the. With that makes it that much lower, no. And that doesn't help with the leading. No. Goes right. Like uh, the leading. The phenomenon is that the echo has a higher wing. Is yeah. That yeah. 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 Do Do you know if the wings insulate the same way as the main pulse? Can you can you just in the main pulse observe? Uh, yes. Although I didn't check super carefully, but they do seem to simulate the same way. Yes. Um, so you're measuring at 149 megahertz. Yep. Um, and how do you get a DM? You've got a range of frequencies. Yeah, so we basically uh, derive it from timing. So we have a template, data derived template, and then we fit it, fit it to the data channel by channel, and then just fit for a quadratic term in the residuals. So over what fractional band of time are you doing that? Uh, so the standard frequency is 149, and we trimmed the data to about 100, 120 to 180 uh, megahertz. Well, you've got a good, good fraction. Yeah. So, so the, and I, I have a standard question I ask for a situation like this. Does the delay of the echo then change the frequency? So um, it doesn't seem to, but as Olaf showed, it, the the ghost is very steep, so the uh, so the yeah so the moment I, the, the those measurements as you probably noticed they don't have uncertainties on them, so I'm I'm just just finishing this better code which gives me proper uncertainties and everything, and I suspect the uncertainties will, will be larger than the sort of expected shift with frequency at least uh, the values that Dana was giving me, which was I think about two milliseconds across the band. Um, but basically, it seems to be, you know, to within a millisecond or, or so to, to be at the same delay. So across your band? Across yeah, across my band. That's, so that's a, like a very tight constraint right there. Yep, yep. You mentioned that the, the ghost is much stronger at low frequency. So when you compare the profiles, do you also compare with the profile at low frequency? Is that the little side band? Yeah. 
No, well, yes, but I, the, the, those, those comparisons were actually done a while ago, and that was done just by scrunching in frequency completely. But yeah, so all the spectral analysis is very behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. They are both parabolic, yeah. But they, they do seem to, like, so, yeah, yeah. So I think this one actually, the closest approach is earlier for, for this oh. for this parabola. So they don't. No, no, they do have different curvature. They have different curvatures and different intercepts. Yep. And zero. Yep. So this, this one, the minimum approach of the, pro of the brightest ghost is at uh, early 2020 from that fit. And this one, I don't remember, but, oh no, yeah, I think it was later. I think it was later. The blue one is later? Yeah. Sorry. Then all of this is DLBI. Did he measure what you call tertiary and primary, or did he measure what you call primary and secondary? Then? No, he measures the primary and, and tertiary because by, by the time, so the second one is yeah. sort of here. Right, okay. So by the time Olaf started observing wherever that, that point is, yeah. they're basically indistinguishable. Right. Yeah. Okay. So Olaf was saying this thing that looks like a collinear yeah. and collinear ah. is a proper motion vector. Yeah, so I. I on the sky. I've yeah. I would have to check my fits, with a, which I can do in two minutes. But I thought I think in my fits they're not collinear. I, I don't think they're collinear in my fits. No, no. I mean, if you have a, you, you have the, you have the formation is. Oh, you, you mean on the sky collinear? But he uses DLBI only. Yep. Formation, and there I remember his talk where he shows the two images yeah. and a velocity vector passing through both. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right, yeah, you'll be pushing. Discussion, I think. Discussion, <laughs> 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 I think. 